So I'm going to start in today's lecture by just first giving you a motivation for why we should be interested in studying public economics. And then I'll talk a little bit about the logistics of the class and give you an outline of the course. So what is public economics? Uh, at a broad level, public economics basically focuses on answering two types of questions. First, how do government policies affect the economy? So for instance, if we have the Romney tax plan instead of the Obama tax plan at a very broad level, what are the impacts going to be on the economy in terms of uh, the number of people who are working, the distribution of income, and so forth? Second is a normative question. How should we optimally design policies in order to maximize welfare? So if we have our choice of different social welfare programs or education finance policies or tax policies, which of these policies should we actually pick and practice in order to maximize economic growth and address distributional concerns? I think there are three motivations for studying these questions. The first is just the practical relevance, the sheer practical relevance, as you can see in the current election, of uh, knowing what the answers to these questions are. The second is academic interest, and the third is methodological. So I'm going to spend some time on each of these three motivations. And while talking through those uh, three aspects of the course, hopefully you'll get a flavor for some of the things we'll do during this class. So motivation one, practical relevance. Uh, you know, I think the simplest reason to be interested in public economics and the way I got interested in the field is I think many of us come to economics with an interest in improving the world in some way and in, in increasing economic welfare, social welfare. And that, I think, directly leads to an interest in public economics. Why is that almost every economic intervention uh, that we think of typically occurs through government policy? That is, it involves public economics uh, through generally two channels. So first, we think of various types of price interventions, so taxes, welfare programs, social insurance, uh, the provision of public goods, all of these are basically the government changing prices in the economy in some way, right? So the government might make, uh, put, a, put a tax on carbon, for instance, to make use of um, uh, polluting materials more costly in order to help the environment. And so any issue that you're interested in, like environmental economics, ultimately ends up having some public economics aspect. The second domain of intervention is regulation, so things like minimum wages, FDA regulations, uh, zoning laws, labor laws, all of these things also involve the government, involve the type of analysis that we'll talk about in this class. Another direct reason that we're interested in studying the role of the government is that it just plays a big role in the economy directly as an employer, even in the US, which has one of the smallest government sectors, one sixth of Americans are employed directly by uh, the government. Now, the stakes in answering these questions are extremely large because of the broad scope of the policies that we're analyzing, right? So for instance, tax reforms are immediately going to affect millions of uh, people. And so these are extremely important questions from that point of view. And there's a very contentious debate on the appropriate role of government in society. So you see this uh, in all, uh, you know, in almost all politi political debates, including the current campaign. So for, to take one concrete example, Mitt Romney argues that replacing Medicare with his proposal of a decentralized private insurance system will improve health outcomes and reduce costs. Obama, in contrast, argues that the Romney proposal will worsen health outcomes and raise costs. Now, only one of these guys can be right, right, by definition. And in principle, we should be able to figure out the answer to that question. Now, you, you, both uh, sides cite economists who support their view. So you know, part of the problem is that we don't really know what the answer is. Um, but you can see that injecting science into these debates has great practical value. And I think we're starting to get to a place in public economics where we have what look more like scientific answers uh, to questions like this. Now, the second motivation for all of you who are, uh, take, might take this course as students is uh, the academic interest of this field. So public economics is typically the endpoint for many other subfields uh, that you might study. So for instance, macro, development, labor, and corporate finance questions often at some ultimate deep level are motivated by a public economics question. So for instance, there's a large literature in macroeconomics on the costs of business cycles and intertemporal models of household behavior, like life cycle models or models with credit constraints, buffer stocks, and so forth. All of those theories at the end of the day matter because we were interested in things like studying unemployment insurance or studying the effects of fiscal stimulus. And so it's very natural to combine public economics with one of these other fields uh, 
as part of your graduate coursework. Uh, another example is uh, studies in labor economics of the uh, employment effects of the minimum wage. Similar kind of rationale, right? You're ultimately interested in the policy question. So I think beyond the specific issue of com combining two fields, I think the other thing that's useful is that understanding public finance can help ensure that you work on relevant topics. So I think especially in applied micro nowadays, there's a lot of focus on finding clever identification methods to answer some empirical question. And I think the concern is that when you approach a problem in that way, you are not necessarily working on something that is important or that other people are going to find interesting, say, when you're on the job market. I think that often ends up not being an issue in public economics because it's very easy to say, you know, you should be interested in understanding the impacts of health insurance or tax policy. Very few people would argue with that. Okay, the third motivation, which I actually think is perhaps the most important one, is that this is a very exciting time in public economics and applied micro more generally in terms of uh, the kinds of work that's being done in the field. And I would say public economics is at the frontier of a methodological transformation in applied micro more broadly. And so the way to think about this, I think, is that uh, people are increasingly taking a, taking a very data-driven approach to answering the important policy questions that we've been talking about. And so rather than, you know, in the past when there was a lot of purely theoretical work or more recently purely empirical work, there's a focus on combining theory and data in a very particular way that I think is powerful in its ability to answer a lot of important questions. And so what you'll see is that the course combines a broad set of skills, applied theory, applied econometrics, and simulation methods. And that's a useful skill set for many applied fields in economics. So we're going to talk about a bunch of different topics in the class, which I will come back to later in the lecture. But all of those are going to reflect a broader set of methodological themes. And so I want to highlight those to start the class so that you see how the various topics we talk about connect back to these basic themes. If there are any questions, please feel free to interrupt at, uh, at any time. OK, so the first important theme is, as I just mentioned, connecting theory to data. So modern public economics tightly integrates theory with empirical evidence to derive quantitative predictions about policy. So take specific questions like what is the optimal income tax rate, say on top income earners, or what is the optimal unemployment benefit level? Uh, we now, I think, have the tools where we're actually able to come up with numbers based on some theory and empirical evidence for what we think these, uh, the answers to these questions are under certain well-defined uh, social welfare functions. And you, what I find quite interesting is that you see the translation not just from academic journals but to the political debate and you see editorials, for instance, in the Wall Street Journal or New York Times citing the results of papers that are exactly answering these questions using the types of uh, methods that we're going to talk about. So there's a lot of practical impact using this approach. Now that differs strongly from the traditional approach. Even you know, 10, 15 years ago, the type of work that was being done in this field which was primarily theoretical work or numerical simulations. So typically, the problem in uh, public economics theory, as in, I think, theory more, more broadly, is that unless you make strong assumptions, the most general, ver general versions of theoretical models of the type we'll talk about in this class make pretty weak predictions. So you know, to take an example, in the tax literature, you get the prediction that the optimal tax rate should be, be between 0 and 100%. And while that you know, might sound trivial. That's actually, as you'll see, not totally trivial to establish uh, mathematically. But that's pretty much all you can get from a purely theoretical model, right? And you can see that if you went to um, advise a presidential campaign with that type of advice, you, you, know, you wouldn't really get very far. So uh, the other technique was numerical simulation. So let me make a lot of assumptions about the parameters of these models and then make a quantitative prediction about what the optimal policy would be. So there you can get much further, but the problem is you're making incredibly strong assumptions about what utility functions look like, what behavioral responses to policies look like, and so forth. And it's very hard to know uh, whether your results are uh, robust to alternative versions of those assumptions. And in practice, they typically are not. So the theme of this course, where we're going to focus on modern work typically you know, within the past 10 to 15 years, is that it uh, derives robust formulas from theoretical models that can be implemented using well-identified empirical estimates. So we start from the types of theoretical models that people were analyzing in the past, uh, but then distill those models to a small set of parameters that matter for a policy question, like optimal tax policy, and then develop really credible research designs 
to estimate those parameters. So you end up using the tools of applied microeconomics, labor, econ uh, labor economics, and so forth to estimate parameters that are highly relevant to these models and uh, answer these, these policy questions. So you'll see that in each of the different uh, topics that we talk about. Now that naturally leads to the second theme, which is the use of quasi-experimental empirical methods. So uh, what you'll see is that uh, throughout the course, you'll basically get an illustration of various quasi-experimental research designs. Uh, for instance, event studies, regression discontinuity, synthetic control. Uh, all of these are uh, the types of methods that we'll talk about in the class. And while we're talking about those different types of methods, I think you'll pick up a number of practical lessons in applied econometrics. So for instance, uh, you know, by the end of the course, hopefully you'd be able to answer all these questions. What is identification by functional form? You often hear that term discussed in seminars, and people usually think that that's not a good idea. So why is that? Uh, when is propensity score reweighting and a useful approach? When does it lead to credible estimation? Uh, what drives weak instrument problems and how can they be fixed? Or another uh, question that, that's often discussed in seminars, are you estimating a local average treatment effect, a late or an average treatment effect? Uh, when should you be concerned about estimating a late as opposed to an eight? What matters in, in uh, different cases? Now all of these issues at some level you learn in a theoretical econometrics class, but at least in my experience, when you actually come to applications, there are a number of practical issues that arise uh, which you can really only learn by doing uh, this type of work and seeing how it's done in, in practice. One thing that I'll emphasize throughout the class is the use of non-parametric graphical techniques rather than parametric regression models. And so I wanna give you an example of what I mean by that uh, just to start, a very simple stylized example. So uh, I'm using here a paper by a famous statistician named Anscombe from 1973 where he illustrated the value, I think, of non-parametric analysis in a very simple way. So what does non-parametric analysis mean? At, at the simplest level, it just means plotting the data or looking at the data directly rather than imposing the assumption that the relationship between two variables is a straight line or is quadratic or something like that. So let's take four different data sets, okay, which hypothetically are show you the relationship between years of schooling and earnings. So people who get more schooling earn more. Here's data set one, where you see that you know, there's a straight line relationship between years of schooling and earnings, if you look at these data points, and you estimate a coefficient of a half uh, with a standard error of 0.12. Now here's a second data set, where you also, if you just ran an OLS regression and did not look at the data, you would conclude that the regression coefficient is a half, and you'd get a standard error of 0.12. Here's a third data set that also produces exactly the same regression coefficient and standard error. And here's a fourth data set that also produ produces the exact same regression coefficient standard error. Now you can see if you actually look at the data, those four relationships are very different, right? And you wouldn't make the same statistical inference from those four graphs, even though if you just ran the OLS regression, which is the typical thing uh, that people used to do, you would conclude exactly the same thing in all four cases. So this is obviously a cooked up illustration to, to make this point, but my sense is that this captures something much broader that's very important in the field, that you'll see that the most compelling evidence now is non-parametric evidence that doesn't rely on any particular functional form assumptions about linearity or uh, quadratic relationship and so forth. Uh, and essentially what you see with the modern research designs like regression discontinuity or synthetic controls, difference and difference, is that they're harnessing this type of non-parametric approach combined with spe specific quasi-experimental designs to deliver these credible estimates, okay? Now, that leads me to th what I see is the third theme of this literature, which is what's co popularly called big data or the use of administrative data uh, in the context of economics. So what you'll find is that compelling implementation of quasi-experimental methods typically requires a tremendous amount of data. So just to go back to this graph, uh, what you'll typically see as a rule of thumb is if you get a t-statistic of two when you run a regression p-value of less than 0.05, which is typically the bar people are shooting for, uh, you will find that if you draw the graph associated with that, it'll look terrible in the sense that you won't actually find it to be very convincing. Uh, in order to get a convincing graph, that is convincing non-parametric identification, you need a tremendous amount of data because you're looking at each of these 
points visually in some sense. Or another way to think about it is if you implement a regression discontinuity design, you're essentially using data very close to a threshold cutoff and throwing away most of the other data in your sample. So you need to start with an enormous sample in order to be uh, well identified. Okay, so the, I think the reason the field is really developing very rapidly now is we increasingly have access to such data sets. Uh, so for example, um, we have scanner data on consumer purchases. We have tax and social security records, which I will talk about a little bit more in a second. We have school district databases, which track kids and have, give you their test scores and teacher assignments and so forth, which we'll talk about toward the end of the class. You have information on peer and social networks from um, uh, websites and other sources. And these data sets have really allowed us to do a number of uh, new things that are very exciting. So just to show you their importance in the field, uh, I want to show you a tabulation that uh, we put together uh, documenting the use of survey data and administrative data in leading economics journals. So take four of the leading economics journals, AER, JPE, QJ, and Econometrica. This chart here plots the fraction of articles that use survey data sets, pre-existing survey data sets. So what I mean by that are data sets like the current population survey, the survey of income and program participation, the panel study of income dynamics. If you took a class like this, say 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, all of the empirical evidence you talk about would be from studies that use these type of data sets. Uh, and in fact, my own uh, thesis, which I, you know, I wrote here, here at Harvard, used uh, some of it used data from the survey of income and program participation. So what you can see is a striking trend where today uh, a very small percentage of articles are using survey-based data sets among a micro empirical studies, right? So for instance, in the QJE, that number looks something like 5% in uh, one of the latest issues. And the way I think about this is this is basically like two papers. The QJE got 1,600 submissions in this year. So if you're starting with you know, a survey data set, you're basically aiming and you're aiming for these types of journals, which is what you should be. You're looking at a, like a two in 1,600 odds, which is obviously not a great uh, situation to be starting from. Now, wh what uh, is substituting for the use of survey data? There are basically two things. One is that people design their own data sets like small experiments where I've, you know, let's say randomized something in a school. I then collect my own follow-up data on those students and then I write a paper using that. So there's some of that. But then the other major source of data is what you see here, the use of administrative data in these same journals. And you can see this very sharp upward trend. And these are data sets like what I was describing, things like school district databases, uh, uh, tax records, and so forth. The fundamental distinction being that I don't need to come and survey you in order to get the information. I automatically get the information because it's recorded in some way when you scan an item at the grocery store, or when you pay your taxes, or when Social Security updates its records, and so forth. So what is the benefit of this type of administrative data? Uh, concretely, first, it provides higher quality information, right? So there's virtually no missing data or attrition. So take the case of the tax data, you know, basically either you're paying taxes in some way or you're dead, more or less, right? So in the US. So uh, you're, you're rarely going to miss people. In contrast, if you take typical survey data sets like the CPS, there's a 31% non-response rate for income. And that, as you might have seen in your first year econometrics classes, creates all kinds of econometric problems to deal with where you have selection bias because you uh, only have information on 70% of the people and so forth. So what you find with these admin data sets is a lot of the basic econometric issues that we worry about, like attrition and selection, end up uh, being non-issues. And you can focus on really developing a credible research design uh, with this high quality information. The second feature of these data are that they permit a longitudinal tracking over long periods. So one of the things that we'll talk a little bit about in this class, but we're just starting to get evidence on, are the long-term impacts of policies, typically because we haven't had the data to analyze the effects of policies, say, 20 or 25 years later. But with administrative data sets, because you're linking people by these identifiers, like Social Security number, uh, you can track people over even, say, 20 plus years, like in these studies of the long-term impacts of early childhood education, which we've recently done here, uh, and look at things, for instance, like 
how the quality of the teachers you had in elementary school, there's a paper we'll talk about toward the very end of the class, how the quality of the teachers you had when you were, say, in kindergarten or in third grade affect your earnings when you're 28 years old. And you can see that the quality of teaching in elementary school does actually have substantial effects on earnings. Uh, and that ends up having various policy implications for how you want to hire teachers, incentivize teachers, and so forth. The other benefit of using these large data sets is their, just their sheer size, right? So the tax data, for instance, are 2,000 times the size of the CPS. And so one benefit of that is that you get smaller standard errors, but that's not the most important one. It's that you can develop new research designs, right? So to illustrate, and this illustrates some of the type of work that we'll do in this class. Um, let's uh, look at the earned income tax credit. So this is from another paper that we've re recently written with uh, John Friedman and Emmanuel Saez. So one of the programs we'll talk about a fair bit in this class is called the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is kind of the, the biggest anti-poverty program in the US is one way to think about it. It provides cash transfers for low-income individuals that increase with the size of uh, your earnings. So if you're earning zero dollars, you get a zero EITC. And then as you earn more, you get about 40 cents on the dollar from the government. Okay, depends, the exact number depends upon the parameters of uh, the structure of your family. And then the refund is maximized at some point, then there's a plateau region, and then it gets cut back, okay? So uh, I just wanna point out that this income level here maximizes the size of your tax refund why is that? Because as you go to the right, you're paying various other taxes to the government, like payroll taxes, right? So if you could pick one point to be in the US tax system, like if you could just make up your income, you'd want to make up an income of $9,300 you know, or, or whatever that cutoff is. All right, so here now is the distribution of income in the US, just plotted using the population tax data. So this is a histogram. It shows you the percentage of people in $1,000 income bins, uh, just you know, from zero to 40K. And take first the one child case, which is the schedule that I was showing you before. You can see that there's a big, fairly big spike in the distribution exactly at that point that maximizes the size of the tax refund, right? So a bunch of people have figured out that this is the point that I wanna be at in the tax system, or at least the point that I wanna tell the IRS that I'm at in the tax system in order to get the biggest refund. For people with two kids, the kink, uh, the refund maximizing point has shifted over a little bit. And so uh, you can see that for those people, the spike again lines up exactly with the point at uh, which they'd maximize the size of the refund, right? So the basic point here is that a bunch of people are responding to tax incentives, and we'll talk about this in more detail later, but we think a lot of this is just non-compliance. That's intuitive because it's very hard to imagine that you actually managed to earn exactly $9,300, right? You, that's something that you can write down on the tax form if you're, say, self-employed. But let's say you're working at Walmart, it's hard to go to your Walmart um, you know, manager and say, I wanna work exactly this many hours so that I maximize my EITC refund. Uh, so now what's interesting about this, and th th this is what I wanna illustrate here with these data, is that Increasingly, you see the use of uh, research designs that would not have been feasible uh, with the types of data sets we had before. So we can look at this distribution by zip code in the US, and that's what uh, this map shows you. So this is a heat map which plots the fraction of people who are reporting exactly that refund maximizing level of income, all right? So think of this as like the fraction of people who figured out the system and figured out how to maximize the size of their tax refund. So the dark areas are places with uh, higher levels of um, response to the earned income tax credit, and the light areas have lower levels of response. So this map is drawn for 1996, and you can see that there are just a few dark spots. 1996 is when the EITC really became big in the US. It was expanded under the Clinton administration. So think of this as kind of year zero for the program. Uh, and so uh, you can see that there are just a few spots like the southern tip of Texas, New York, uh, the southern tip of Florida where there's substantial response right when the program is introduced. Now let's look at what happens over time. Says 1999, 2002, 2005, 2008. You can see like it looks like this knowledge is kind of disseminating from southern Texas, right? Uh, as the, the, the spread of response to the EITC um, over time. 
And so we'll talk in more detail about this paper later on, but this basically gives you a research design to contrast places where, like uh, North Dakota, where people don't seem to be responding very much to the EITC with other places in order to figure out the impacts of the program on the local economy, right? Which is obviously a design that you could not have implemented with uh, previously available data resources. Okay, now a, a next important theme in the field uh, is that uh, work in public economics is heavily influenced by insights from many other fields, but in particular psychology and economics, behavioral economics. Uh, and I think that's because of growing evidence that people fail to optimize in various dimensions, and that creates a direct role for government intervention, right? It raises new policy questions, and it suggests new policy instruments. So to take one example, there's growing evidence that people don't really pay attention to their retirement savings accounts, the work of David Labeson, Bridget Madry, and others, and that creates an important set of questions in terms of what the government should be doing. Should the government uh, mandate that people save a certain amount? Should it subsidize certain types of retirement accounts? Should it perhaps have defaults that automatically enroll people in certain types of plans? There are costs and benefits to all of these different policy options. You wouldn't really have thought of them prior to thinking about the behavioral economics literature, but I would say now they're front and center uh, in this field. And just to give you an example in the context of what we were just talking about, so those maps with the uh, EITC higher and lower response, what are, the, what, what are the characteristics of the places where people are responding much more to the EITC? Turns out that the single strongest predictor, which by itself has an R squared of 0.6, which is quite high, um, is the density of EITC filers in your area. So you could kind of see that if we go back to this map. The places where people are not responding are the places that don't have a lot of density of uh, EITC filers, or for that matter, I mean just North Dakota, not much density of people in, in general, not just the ITC filers. So you can see that the really uh, dense places are the places where people are responding and what's the intuition for that? We think it's something like agglomeration or peer effects. If you're out in the middle of nowhere and you're eligible for this program, you've never heard about it and nobody's gonna tell you about it. If you live in an apartment building where lots of other people are claiming the EITC, you yourself are likely to hear about it and figure it out, right? And so that suggests that information and uh, peer networks might be a key determinant of response to policies. And so one of the things that might come out of this is rather than expanding expenditure on the EITC by increasing that 40 cent match to a 50 cent match, maybe what we should be doing is getting the information out there to the places where people are not responding, which could potentially be much cheaper, right? So we're currently spending $50 billion a year on the EITC maybe it would be much more effective in increasing labor supply of low-income individuals if it was structured uh, differently. Okay, so let me now uh, start to get into the material a little bit uh, and uh, just start with a broad overview of what the government does. So government expenditures account for about one-third of GDP in the US, and that is actually relatively low relative to most other uh, developed countries. So in many European countries, more than 50% of GDP is government expenditure. A key feature of the US government is decentralization. We have government at multiple levels. Uh, one third of the spending is done at the state or local level, and two thirds is done at the federal level. So one natural question right away is why are we doing some of the spending like on public schools at the local level, and why is some of the spending done like on social insurance being done at the federal level. Now, uh, here's a time series of what federal government revenue and expenditure look like. Now, I apologize, but this is actually, the labels are switched, so you should correct that in your notes. So revenue did not spike during World War II, the expenditure did. Uh, and uh, what you can see is that, you know, we're roughly 20% of uh, GDP now, that number has crept up a little bit. Romney is uh, arguing that we should have a cap of 20% of GDP to bring expenditure back down. Uh, you can see that we were running a uh, surplus around uh, 2000, but then uh, after that we've had deficits and so forth. Uh, and at a broad level, revenues and expenditures look roughly aligned, which you would hope they would be. Um, but you know, increasingly we know that that is not the case, which is exactly the problem of the growing debt, and the oh, question is how we address that. 
Now here's what government spending looks like by country. You can see that there are vast differences. So as I was saying, the US is considerably low. This is adding state and federal now, right? So that's why we're at 30%. US considerably lower than these other countries. And so you know, one of the big picture questions is, what's the optimal level of government size at some level? Is it, uh, that's going to depend upon the details of what the government's doing. But do we want kind of a, Sweden, a Swedish type of uh, social safety net where you get several months of maternity leave when you have a child paid for by the government and so forth? Or do we want something more like the US? Or do we want to go more in this direction? You can see that there are big uh, questions here and substantial variation. Now, where are we uh, collecting uh, our money in, in the US? So federal tax revenues have changed considerably over time. So in 1960, the vast majority of the revenue the government got was coming from income taxes and corporate taxes, and to a much lesser extent, payroll taxes and excise taxes. So what are payroll taxes? They are levied on wage earnings directly uh, rather than on total household income. So for instance, the social security tax that's automatically deducted when you get paid, or FICA, is, uh, that's what's called the payroll tax. The income tax that you pay at the end, once you add in, uh, uh, you take account of all your deductions and capital income and so forth, that's what we call the income tax. So the main shift that you can see from 1960 to today is that there was a substantial expansion of payroll taxes, right? And so does someone know why that is? Why are we collecting a lot more money from the payroll tax today instead of income taxes? What, what changed? Is that, yeah, Medicare, social insurance programs more broadly, Medicare, social security. We're spending a lot more on these social insurance programs that are financed by payroll taxes, right? And so that's probably the single biggest shift in the nature of uh, revenue collection in the US. And uh, at the state and local level, there are also some changes, somewhat smaller. We used to collect a lot of money from property taxes, typically used to finance schools. That's become much less important. But what has become more important are income taxes and federal grants. So that is money being collected by the federal government and then being passed on to the state in the form of a block grant that the state can spend on various things. Okay. Now, uh, what, what is the government spending the money on? Uh, exactly as we just talked about, the biggest, the single biggest shift, and this motivates the nature of research today, is that we spend a lot more money on social insurance programs and transfer today than we did in 1960. So take in particular the case of health, 2.9% in 1960, 23% today, and projected to continue to grow very rapidly, right? If you just linearly extrapolate, it's gonna be 100% not only of government spending, but of GDP. Uh, so obviously something will change before then, hopefully. Uh, uh, but that's the major shift. And so if you look at what the government's actually spending money on, the vast majority of it are transfers from one person to another. So if I'm unemployed and you have a job, you're effectively giving me money through the government. If when you retire, somebody's giving you money, paying, through, paying for it through payroll taxes, et cetera, right? So all of this stuff <coughs> basically looks like that. And then we spend a little bit of money on national defense, on education, on things like roads and infrastructure. And so the consequence of that is in the earlier literature, economists didn't really have very much to say about optimal spending, right? Because economists don't have much to say about the best way to build a highway, for example. But if you, uh, when the expenditures on things like social security or health insurance there is actually a lot of economics in that. There are incentive effects, there are welfare effects, and so forth. And so there's a huge growing literature on uh, these programs more recently. Now, the way in which the US collects its, its money is actually quite different from most other countries. And the single biggest difference is that we don't use much consumption taxation. In fact, at the federal level, we use virtually no consumption taxation. All the taxation is of income rather than expenditures, right? Whereas in these other countries, you tend to have very large value added taxes or taxes at the point of sale. So uh, take in particular developing countries like Mexico, you can see that consumption taxes are huge there. What, why do we, someone guess why that is? Yeah, Pascal. 
yeah, it's much harder to enforce an income tax than it is a consumption tax typically. And so develop, uh, developing countries tend to rely on consumption taxes for the, that reason. Now even developed countries rely on consumption taxes quite a bit like the value added tax because many economists tend to think that value added taxes are actually more efficient than income taxation. And we'll touch upon this briefly uh, later on in the class. Uh, the US for whatever political reason has not uh, gone in that direction. Okay, so uh, now to broadly organize the class, the question we always ask to start analysis of any of these topics is when is government intervention necessary? That is, we take a market first, government second approach. Uh, so why is that? Because you know from your introductory economics classes that the private market outcome is typically efficient under a pretty broad set of conditions. So we usually think that private markets are going to do a good job in terms of delivering economic outcomes that we like. And so the government should only be fixing up what goes wrong with the private market. And that's very much the way you'll see we'll approach each one of these questions. Why is it that we actually need the government to do something? And conditional on the government do, doing something, what, you know, what should the government do? So the course can be abstractly split into two parts. The first is how can government improve efficiency when the private market is inefficient? The second is what can the government do if the private market outcome is undesirable because of redistributional concerns? So the private market outcome might be efficient, but we might not like its distributional properties, and so we still might want to do something as a social planner. So to illustrate, let's take the simplest possible exchange economy where let's say uh, you have 10 apples that you're dividing between Amy and Bob. The efficient frontier is to have all of the 10 apples allocated to one or the other so that you're on the blue line, right? And we think that the private market is typically gonna uh, deliver an outcome that's gonna be on that frontier. And so then from an efficiency point of view, we're not worried about it. It's not like we could have made Amy better off without hurting Bob, right? We're on the Pareto efficient frontier. Now there are gonna be some cases where the private market actually delivers an outcome like this, where some of the apples, some of the resources are essentially being wasted and we can make everyone better off and so we want the government to intervene. And so the first set of topics in the class or the you know, first half of public economics is basically about how we improve efficiency. What are the circumstances where we can improve efficiency? Now there are situations where we, the market might deliver an efficient outcome, and so we're not concerned about improving efficiency, but we're unhappy with the distributional properties, right? So if Amy gets all the apples and Bob doesn't have uh, any, we might not like that, and so then we might want to implement tax or transfer policies to shift the outcome to something that is more desirable from a social welfare point of view. So what are the conditions under which the private market provides a Pareto efficient outcome. This should be familiar to you from prior economics classes. We know from the first welfare theorem that uh, there are three conditions needed for the private market to provide an efficient outcome. The first is that there are no externalities. The second is that we have perfect information. And the third is that we have perfect competition. And the way I think to think about this class is that it's basically a class about the failure of the first welfare theorem. Like what are the cases where the first welfare theorem fails and what can we do about it? So let's talk about each of these failures in turn. So start with externalities. So uh, the issue with externalities is that markets may be incomplete uh, due to a lack of prices essentially. So I think the best way to think about externalities is not so much that there's some property of certain types of transactions, but that they're really about missing markets. So for instance, pollution would not be thought of as an externality if there were a market for pollution, if there was a price I had to pay every time I emitted pollution as a firm, right? There would be no externality there. And so we think in practice that there are not markets for many things people care about. And so achieving the efficient solution, well, and we'll talk about all this in more detail, requires some sort of organization to coordinate individuals. Like if all of us are having externalities on each other, we want somebody to come in and coordinate everyone to reach uh, a better equilibrium. And what is that organization? Typically it's the government, right? The government serves that function of dealing with large scale externalities at some level. 
by putting in uh, restrictions on pollution or imposing taxes and so forth. So this is why the government, so it makes sense that we need the government to intervene when we have externalities. That's why the government funds uh, public goods. Uh, but there are important questions of what public goods the government should be providing and what are the best tools to correct externalities. So one of the questions we'll talk about, for instance, is I could regulate the level of pollution or I could impose a tax on pollution. These are two different policy instruments. Uh, and in a very well-known paper, our colleague Marty Weitzman here uh, talked about the trade-off between using price methods versus quantity methods. And we'll talk about that paper uh, later in the class. So the second uh, set of failures also has to do with incomplete markets. And that's uh, asymmetric information. So when some people have more information than others, we know that markets will generally fail. So the classic example is adverse selection, often in the context of health insurance. So take an example where everybody knows their health status. Uh, healthy people are not going to want to buy insurance if it's priced for the average person. Because I'm going to think, you know, I don't want to pay $1,000, uh, let's say, for this health insurance plan because my probability of getting sick is very low. So I'm going to drop out. But that's going to make the average person in the population sicker. Health insurance company is going to have to raise premiums in order to not go broke. And that cycle keeps continuing until the market breaks down. So this is a situation where mandated coverage could potentially make everyone better off. Uh, and government intervention could be warranted. Another example, uh, which is highly relevant actually in the current economy, is uh, capital market imperfections or credit constraints, where essentially there's similar type of asymmetric information problem that I would be willing to lend you money if I knew that you were a reliable borrower. But I have no way of knowing if you're reliable or if you're like one of those other guys who's not going to pay me back. So I end up putting much tighter restrictions on lending than I otherwise would. Uh, and this can potentially have very important long-term consequences, tying back to that earlier theme of looking at long-term impacts. What are the impacts of providing access to credit for education? If we expand the Pell Grant program in the US, which enables a lot of people to go to college, does that have high returns? Does the government sort of get its money back in terms of tax dollars? Does it increase uh, GDP in the long run? These are all questions on which we have some evidence, but we could use much more evidence uh, going forward. I think they're very important questions. A third uh, example, which is not really about asymmetric information per se, but it's sort of uh, in complete markets, is uh, markets for intergenerational goods, right? So in the, uh, in the standard first welfare theorem type of analysis, the neoclassical model, we assume that all the participants are at the table. That is, everybody who's affected by an uh, economic decision has their interests represented in some sense in the economy. But future generations are not, their interests are not being directly internalized, right? Uh, when we make choices about what to invest in or how much to pollute and so forth. And so you might think that the government is acting as a representative not only of the current generations, but of future generations as well. And so may basically make people more patient than they otherwise would be, taking into account these future generations. Okay, so all of those are issues we'll talk about, especially in the context of social insurance. The third uh, failure is imperfect competition. So when markets are not competitive, there's again a role for government regulation. So we know that when we have monopolies, they're not going to go to the point where price equals marginal cost. And especially when we have natural monopolies like electricity or telephone markets, uh, there are, you, you naturally end up wanting to have to regulate uh, these suppliers in order to get them to behave in the way that you'd like from a social point of view. That topic, for historical reasons, I think, is left to courses on industrial organization and is not typically covered in public economics. Now, intellectually, my view is that that doesn't necessarily make sense. Uh, the methodological approaches that we're going to talk about here in the public economics course, I think, could well be applied to issues related to regulation. There's a very interesting set of work to be done, I think, in that direction. Uh, and there, there's some people starting to do this type of work. So for instance, Glenn Weil at Chicago is applying some of the tools that we'll talk about here to IO type of problems. What you'll notice is also a good place to discuss the difference between the types of methods that have 
become popular in I.O. versus labor and public economics. You'll notice if some of you are taking all of these classes that there's a very different style uh, of empirical work that you'll be exposed to. And I highly encourage you to learn about all the different approaches. Uh, I.O. tends to take more of a structural approach where we're trying to character fully identify the model and then characterize what the equilibrium looks like and what the impacts of policy changes are on equilibria. Public economics has gone in the direction of being less reliant on estimating all the parameters of a theoretical model, but that naturally puts some restrictions on the types of questions we're able to answer. But within the domain of questions we answer, I think we're, we're able to obtain answers that are much less dependent on strong modeling assumptions. The, thir the final set of motives, which is what we touched upon a little bit earlier, are not market failures, but individual failures. So this is not something that we really would have talked about in the traditional public economics class, but increasingly it's clear that this is very important. Uh, if people don't optimize, then government intervention may be desirable. So for instance, we might want to force people to save for retirement, for instance, via a social security program, independent of whether there are any market failures. And I actually think this is extremely important because uh, Intuitively, and from looking at the work in this area, while I think we can formulate reasons for government intervention in markets like Social Security, uh, so you know there might be some asymmetric information in annuity markets that makes the government provide these Social Security annuities. In practice, I think what it really boils down to is that if we didn't make people prepare for retirement in some way, we'd end up with a bunch of people who showed up with no assets when they were uh, retiring because they hadn't planned uh, properly, you'd have very high elderly poverty rate, and you want to do something about that, so you end up having Social Security. So I think while it's sometimes theoretically elegant to come up with market failure type motivations for some of the programs we're going to discuss, in reality what seems to resonate with politicians and the public is that it's really about addressing uh, individual failures in many circumstances, and I think further developing this literature is a direction that's uh, going to be important. So a key conceptual challenge, this literature is much at a much earlier stage, right? And so there's still a bunch of conceptual issues to be worked at. One of the most important ones is how you avoid the paternalism critique. How is the government supposed to know what's better for you than you yourself? So who is the social planner to come in and say, you should be saving more, or you should be wearing a seatbelt, or you should not be smoking, et cetera, right? Uh, and that's really important in terms of uh, doing theoretical work in this area because if you don't answer that question, you basically have no discipline in terms of determining optimal policy. So if you're respecting individuals' preferences, which is the traditional approach, then you have a well-defined objective function which you can talk about how you maximize when you're subject to various market failures. And that's what a lot of public economics is about. But when I say you know, individuals are maximizing utility function U, and I, as the social planner, want to maximize utility function V, and V is just something I've made up, and I have no discipline on what V is, then obviously I have no discipline on what policy recommendations come out of that. And so one of the challenges is how do you do behavioral economics in a well-defined, systematic way when you don't trust individuals' own uh, utility function? Okay, now the last set of of topics is uh, redistribution, right? So even when the private market outcome is efficient, it may not have good distributional properties. And I think we're increasingly seeing, see this all the time now in the, in the popular debate, that efficient markets seem to deliver very large rewards to a very small set of people, right? So this is a discussion about top income inequality in the US and how a tiny share of people have an enormous amount of the wealth and the income uh, in the economy, both in the US and in many other countries. And so people tend not to like that outcome. And so you know, what can we do about that? Well, the government can redistribute income through the tax and transfer system, like the earned income tax credit by taxing high incomes and so forth. Now, that might naturally lead you to think, well, why don't we just have the government do everything, right? If the government uh, is, can deal with this problem of distribution and potentially implement the types of outcomes that the market implements, why do we limit government intervention in any way? And so, you know, the way to think about that is we, one solution to all of these issues would be for the government to oversee all production and allocation in the economy, right? Like a socialist approach. 
So this goes exactly against that market first, government second approach that I said we'd take in this class. And I want to talk about why we don't approach it from this perspective. I think there's some deep problems with the solution that relate basically to informational issues. Uh, the first is that the government is not really in a position to aggregate people's preferences and technology to choose the optimal level of production and the optimal allocation of resources. So to take an example, you know, suppose I was to determine how everyone in this room would be allocated some fixed set of resources. If I want to know what everybody's utility function looks like so that I can give the people who really like candy bars more candy bars and the people who like more apples more apples, right? Now, how am I going to elicit those preferences? If I go around and ask everyone, there's no way you can have a uh, incentive compatible mechanism designed there because you have no reason to tell me the truth, right? You should say, you know, I love candy bars and I love apples, so give me everything, right? Uh, and so there's no real way for the government to elicit information properly. That's one deep problem. The second deep problem is that even if the government manages to implement some allocation, you have to take into account that the government can't fully control really what people do. And so if I tell you I'm going to perfectly redistribute resources across individuals in some way, like let's say I equally split the number of apples across people no matter what, then you essentially have no reason to put in any effort in production, right? Your incentives are completely distorted because the rewards you get bear no relation to the allocation you're going to be assigned by the government. And so what that generates in practice is a situation where the government can't actually do everything. You have to rely on the private market to do most of the stuff and then you fix it up. But the consequence, especially of the second point, is that there are sharp trade-offs between the costs and benefits of government intervention. So that picture before where we had the red dot moving along the frontier to implement, to improve distribution, that's actually never feasible, right? What we actually end up doing is as we distribute resources from Amy to Bob, we end up moving into the interior of the set because it's infeasible to uh, give resources to Bob uh, and take them away from Amy without distorting Bob's incentives to work, for instance. Okay, and so you end up then having to answer this question, which I see as kind of the heart of the political debate at some level. How far in am I willing to go in order to achieve more equity, right? That's the basic idea of the equity efficiency trade-off, and it arises in numerous contexts that we will talk about. So uh, another way to organize the class, a related way, is that there are going to be three types of questions one can think about answering. The first is a set of issues related to what people call positive analysis. What are the observed effects of government programs and interventions in practice? So to take an example, suppose I change tax rates by 10%. What actually happens in practice? How much less do people work? Uh, what happens to, say, GDP if we're able to measure such aggregate effects and so forth? All of that is positive analysis. The second uh, set of issues, which typically builds on the first, is normative analysis. What should we do if we can set the optimal policy? So as we've been talking about, what's the optimal design of these various programs? Usually what you'll see is that you need to take the lessons learned from positive analysis in order to say something meaningful normatively. A third set of issues, which we will not talk about in this class, but would be addressed in a political economy class, are uh, what's typically called public choice. Uh, developing theories to explain why the government behaves the way it does. So one way to think about that is it's a positive analysis of the government itself. So why does the U.S. have more income taxation while European countries have more consumption taxation? There must be some reason for that. And we can develop theories of why um, the institutions have developed such that these countries are, are doing different things, right? A related issue is to identify optimal policy given political economy concerns. So in the type of normative analysis we'll talk about in this class, it's going to be as if politics didn't, doesn't exist. It's like, what would we do optimally if we could just set the policy? But in reality, you're always going to face political constraints. And so a more nuanced way to think about it is what's the optimal policy subject to the fact that I actually have to get this thing approved by the voters at some level. <coughs> 
Uh, and that's the standard criticism of pure normative analysis, and that's more of a political economy approach, uh, which I think makes a lot of sense, but is not uh, going to be what we cover in, in this class. So here's an outline of uh, what the uh, course will look like. So in the next couple of lectures, we will talk about the very basic uh, issues of tax incidence and the efficiency costs of taxes. So these are examples of positive analysis. So when I have changes in tax rates, how is the distributional burden of that tax shared across agents in the economy? How does it affect the level of output, et cetera? Then we'll take those tools and use them to address a set of normative issues in optimal tax analysis. So what's the optimal design of consumption taxes? What's the optimal way to treat savings? What's the optimal income tax system? What's the best way to design the transfer system? And we'll talk about a bunch of theory and evidence in, in all of these sections. We'll then spend some time focusing on one particular empirical literature that's very large, which is the effects of income taxes on labor supply, because that's viewed as a key thing. The income tax is central in most developed economies. And the key dimension it distorts is the amount people work. So there's a big empir empirical literature that also connects to labor on that topic. We'll then do a couple of lectures on corporate taxes. You'll see that the corporate tax literature is actually pretty old because people haven't been working on it uh, for a while. And we actually didn't even teach it the past uh, couple of years. But I'm, I've incorporated those lectures this year because my sense is that there is a lot of interesting stuff to be uh, done in that area. And so I want people to be exposed to it. Uh, we'll then uh, do um, a section on social insurance. So these last two lectures you can think of as being more focused on expenditures. The first four lectures, the first four sets of topics are on uh, a collection of tax revenue. So social insurance and then public goods and externalities. So how do we correct uh, uh, situations where we have externalities where we want to provide public goods? And there I'm adding a lecture this year on education policy, which you know, one of the issues is should we really think of education as a public good? Now in practice, you know, that's not entirely clear, but anyway, we have the government intervening substantially in education markets, and what's the best way for the government to intervene? That is a really uh, hot area, and so I think it's useful to um, talk a little bit about those issues from a uh, public finance perspective.